On New Year's Day in 1998, the British charter airline Air Tours International was operating one of their 757s on a charter between Bangor, Maine in the United States and Porto Plata in the Dominican Republic. There were 220 passengers, 8 cabin crew, and 2 pilots on board the aircraft for a flight that was going to take just under 4 hours. Hello Captain, we're ready for pushback. The captain of his flight was 53 years old with 15,300 flying hours. Of those, 760 were on the 757. The captain had a limitation when flying that said he had to be wearing his prescription glasses, which he did have on this flight. The first officer was 34 years old with 4,200 hours. Of those, 850 were on the 757, making him slightly more experienced on the aircraft than the captain. The aircraft itself was delivered to the airline brand new in March 1997, so it was barely nine months old at the time of the accident. Prior to departure, the pilots had been briefed on the forecast in Porto Plata, which was for greater than 10 miles visibility, clear skies, and relatively calm weather. However, they knew there would be significant weather in the area around the time they were arriving, and they did have an alternate airport of Santo Domingo, in case they couldn't get in safely to Porto Plata. Around 3.15 local time, the aircraft departed Bangor under clear skies and headed south over the Atlantic out towards Porto Plata. En route, there was a passenger disturbance, and the captain ended up spending much of the cruise dealing with that and filling out paperwork to hand to the ground agents upon arrival in the Dominican Republic. About 20 minutes before the aircraft was to make its descent into Porto Plata, the pilot allowed a short cockpit visit with one of the passengers. However, at no time during the start of the approach did the crew get an updated weather briefing as the weather began to deteriorate in Porto Plata. Around the top of descent, the crew got a weather update from Santo Domingo Center just before they started their approach. The update was the winds were at 130 degrees at 9 knots, with scattered clouds at 1,200 feet with rain and temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Visibility was not given by the controllers and the crew didn't request it. They descended into heavy rain and they could paint a significant weather over the airport on their radar. As the aircraft approached Porto Plata, it was assigned landing on runway 26 and given the runway 26 VOR approach, which had the aircraft flying a 12 mile arc around the airport and had a decision height of 700 feet, at which point the crew would have to go around if they weren't in contact with the runway or any other legal identifier. On the approach, the crew was high and fast. Although company standard policy said the aircraft was supposed to pass over the initial approach fix with the gear down, the flaps at 20, and at 210 knots, the aircraft passed overhead at 260 knots at flaps 5 with the gear down. The captain didn't tell the first officer that he was going to deviate from standard policy until he already had selected flaps 5 and was already coming up on the initial approach fix high and fast. With the aircraft being 1,000 feet higher than standard as it crossed over the initial approach fix on its first approach. Though the crew was able to make out some features on the ground, they were not able to identify the runway lights or anything that allowed them to continue the approach. So as the aircraft reached 700 feet, the crew applied power and performed their first go-around. From the go-around, the aircraft was placed into a holding pattern. The captain calculated that the aircraft could hold for 50 minutes before diverting to Santa Domingo. However, the aircraft only ended up holding 25 minutes before several other aircraft were able to land and the captain decided to shoot another approach. While some aircraft did get in, those were all local aircraft, and all North American and European flights inbound to the airport had diverted to Santo Domingo by the time the crew attempted their second approach. As the crew began their second approach, they saw that the weather radar returns had all moved to the southwest and the storm was no longer over the airport. However, the conditions were now overcast at 800 feet and the visibility was only about two and a half nautical miles in mist and heavy rain. The crew continued the approach. Though this time the crew did break out of the clouds and identify the runway lights, 
They were unstable when they got to 400 feet and not properly aligned with the runway. So the captain called for a go around, but instead of a normal go around and missed approach procedure, the captain elected in the low visibility and low ceilings to do a circling pattern to return to runway 26 and land. In order to maintain visual contact with the runway, the captain threw the aircraft into a very steep and aggressive maneuver on his pattern to return to runway 26. This took the aircraft in and out of cloud as the aircraft climbed between four and 700 feet and the aircraft had a maximum bank angle during this maneuver of over 37 degrees. Unsurprisingly, the captain quickly lost visual contact with the runway. However, the first officer said that he was able to maintain visual contact with the runway, so the captain continued the maneuver. During the maneuver, the captain's glasses fell off, further impairing his vision. However, the captain continued the maneuver. As the aircraft approached the runway, it was unstable and the captain was well to the right of the runway. However, rather than going around again, the captain tried to salvage the landing. Unable to do so, the aircraft touched down to the right of the runway with the left gear contacting the grass to the right of runway 26 and the tail striking the ground, causing severe damage unbeknownst to the crew. The captain called for a go around and claims that he did not realize that the wheel did not contact the runway and had no idea that there had been any off airport contact. Despite severe damage to the rear of the aircraft, the APU was still running normally and there were no control issues. The aircraft climbed to flight level 220 and made a normal diversion to Santo Domingo to the south where the weather was clear and the aircraft made an uneventful landing. Upon parking at the gate, the passengers began to disembark. While the passengers were deboarding the aircraft, the flight attendants opened the rear passenger door and were immediately overcome by the smell of jet fuel. They notified the flight crew and the first officer very quickly shut down the APU. The captain worried that he should evacuate the aircraft, but as a third of the passengers had already deboarded the aircraft, and as there was no visible smoke or fire, the captain decided not to evacuate the aircraft. It was only after this that the first officer walked around the aircraft and discovered the true extent of the damage. The APU was severely damaged, as was the whole tail section. In addition, there was damage to the horizontal stabilizer and to the left gear, which still had grass and mud jammed into it. Unfortunately, Due to the pouring rain, by the time investigators got to the Porto Plata airport, all markings in the grass from the contact of the aircraft's tail and left gear had already been washed away in the mud. Despite the significant damage, nobody was injured in the incident and the aircraft was repaired on site and re-entered service a few weeks later. Ultimately, most of the blame for this accident rested with the captain as he was responsible for the safe operation of this flight and deviated on multiple occasions unnecessarily from standard operating procedures. But the first officer was also singled out as he should have spoken up and not allowed the captain to put the aircraft in the predicament that it ended up in.